start I've got six oh five fifty nine I can start it's five fifty nine um, thank you so much for coming to our board meeting tonight um, we want to thank all the district office staff for coming and I don't know if we have um, I don't see TEA or spot SD or anything, and we're grateful for any members of the public that are here. We're going to start out with a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, patron comments. I think I saw a few. I'm just going to remind on patron comments quickly, just um, some of the policies is that um, the board doesn't respond to the comments, especially uh, since they're not agenda items. So um, anyways, we'll start with that. Um, Oh, and everyone has three minutes. We'll start with Rebecca Darling. If you'll just state your name, and then we'll start three minutes. Thank Testing you. On. Oh, it is. Yes. Okay. My name is Rebecca Darling. I'm a longtime listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> hope that wasn't my two minutes. No, I just want to thank you guys because I know how hard your job is. I, you know, ran the flag football league. I know how parents get, and teachers are the worst, but we love. I love my job. I teach at Clark Johnson Junior High, and I'm a mom of many kids who went through this system, and um, I have loved you guys. I've been an advocate for Tula County School District for a long time, um, but I'm also very vocal sometimes when I feel we're making a mistake. And so I just wanted to talk again real quick about the naming of the new high school. I really think that that is a, a huge mistake. Sorry, now I'm going to cry. Um, and a lot of people agree with me um, for different reasons. Some for the separation of church and state. Um, some for um, my church is sacred. Don't name a stupid high school after it. I got those comments early. I did. And other that... Um, Desert Peaks in Grantsville, why is Twilla stealing our name? That one came across as well. Um, but I'm an advocate for kids, from the most popular student body officers to that small kid who doesn't know where they belong. <laughs> and I really worry about that kid because that name is, I live right between the school and the church. And on Friday evening, my pride flag was stolen. <laughs> And it was found, it was found three and a half miles away um, behind a church at, um, by Copper Canyon. And I'm not saying it was a church person, it was probably just kids. But the comments I got on Facebook, just saying that I wanted it found. And the hate that these kids go through. My kid is um, gender 
fluid and the hate that they face, they don't need that high school. And that church and that school will be connected. They will. And hopefully they're not, but they're going to be. I talked to some people who graduated from Manti High in probably 1980-something, and they're tied. They're tied. So I just want to ask that you reconsider that name and save it for school in Grantsville. And just save it. Because there's going to be more schools in Grantsville. It's grown almost as fast as Overlake or whatever you want to call us over there. I thought I lived in Overlake. I don't. I live in like Sunset something or the others. I always thought it was Overlake. I joined the Overlake board. They're like, you don't live in Overlake, but you're welcome. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, it's probably close to my three minutes, but that's just what I wanted to say. And I'm sorry for the tears, but I love my kids. I love all these kids, and I just don't want anyone to feel lost. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Park. Okay, my name is Corey Park, and um, I wanted to address the change back to Wednesday for the early out. Um, I'm not saying do or don't. Um, what I'm saying is not now. We sent all of our parents scrambling a few years ago. They had to rearrange schedules, um, get child care, things like that. Um, to change it to Fridays. Then we sent everybody scrambling last year when we stopped school early to find childcare. And then they went, they went through a very stressful year, a lot of parents, where homes were, ten, ten, there was tension. Some fathers had to come home and try to work while kids were there trying to do their things. So just a lot of stress on families. I'm just saying now isn't the time. Let's revisit it for the 22-23 school year possibly um, get some plenty of parent input on it and then um, then maybe make the decision then but let's have just a year where the parents aren't thrown into another wreck when they've been through so much already that's all I want to say thanks okay moving on to consent items do I have a motion I motion to approve the consent items. I'll second. Motion by Camille, seconded by Scott to approve the consent items. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, number four, uh, information discussion or calendar items. Our first um, thing is student body advisory report. And we have uh, student body officers from Tooele High School. So if you'll come up and introduce yourselves. We're, I see we've got some Stansbury student officers here to support. I didn't see Grantsville. Did it? Anyways. So I'm Brock Beer. I'm the Twilla High School Senate leader. So I just run our Senate meetings at Twilla. And then I'm Luke Wilson. I'm the, or was, the Twilla High School student body <laughs> president this last year. Um, first off, just good evening. Uh, we'd like to take a second to thank you, um, the school board, for allowing us this opportunity to present this bill uh, to you and about an issue that uh, we, the students, of these schools have witnessed and um, have been striving to find a solution to. Uh, ever since I can remember, my close friends have been student athletes, and even though I only play one sport myself, uh, many of these close friends of mine are year-round athletes uh, who are involved in several extracurricular uh, activities and sporting uh, athletics. And so, however, um, as we progress through high school, uh, Sorry. Some of these bonds I've made with these friends uh, have drifted apart to the point where um, we don't even talk anymore. And I have lost numerous what I thought would be lifelong friendships, not because necessarily uh, we had different interests or um, lost our connections, but simply because of the use of drugs and the drug use got to the best of them. I, along with students and staff who are here tonight, have witnessed this 
with other student athletes and their relationships with their peers and how it's affected them. And from like the star players of the football team to the greatest wrestlers and dancers, all the way down to basketball players and band members, drug use and abuse has somehow affected every athletic uh, team and extracurricular activity. So this like drug testing proposal, it actually started about like two years ago. We at Tula High School, we have these Senate meetings and it's pretty much just like a mini like House of Representatives. We propose bills to help change the school and then we vote on them as a student government group. So last spring we discussed this drug testing bill and it passed with a vote of 24 to zero. So, and then because of COVID, we weren't able to push it back past the school level because we all just went home and didn't do anything. And so, and then we re I reproposed this bill this year with, and it passed again with a vote of 24 to zero. So that's in two years, that's an astonishing 48 to zero vote from two different years of student government members at Tooele High School. And while we were writing this bill, we began to see unrivaled support from our coaches, our faculty and our administration and even students. And so in this little packet thing that I gave you, there's um, where the bullet points are. It's, a, it's our kind of proposed way to kind of implement drug testing. By no means is it like what we need to do. It's just kind of what we talked about as a student government with costs and how to administer the test. So if you just like to look at that, you can. Um, sorry, okay. Um, not only has this bill been revised and edited by two separate student government organizations, uh, but we have had an immense push by school administrators, coaches, and parents uh, to establish this drug testing policy amongst the student amongst amongst the athletics and extracurriculars um, of our school district. Uh, provided in your packets, there is a page in the very back uh, with a list of names um, that we got who support this bill. And although it may seem small, this list of names uh, were just a few of what we gathered within one, a one hour class period during school. So we've also seen that other schools in the state have been able to successfully implement drug mm -hmm. testing. So for reference in those packets, I've also added the drug testing policies for the Davis School District, the Ogden City School District, and the Cache County School District. And in the proposal itself, I also attached the like three different schools that have implemented drug testing and the different ways that they've paid for it and that they've carried out drug testing successfully. And with talking to the administrators at these different high schools, they've all said that drug testing has made a major impact on helping prevent students from using drugs in their high school. So drug testing will also go hand in hand with the recently passed district policy, code 5065, titled Reporting of Student Prohibited Acts. Drug testing will give more teeth to this policy and it will allow for administrators and faculties to report the illegal use of drugs more effectively. Um, although it may appear as though drug use is not a problem within student athletes in our district, um, it is in fact a silent, thriving, and growing epidemic amongst these athletes. Uh, we urge and plead with you to take high consideration in implementing this drug policy uh, for this upcoming school year and beyond. These athletes are the undeclared leaders of our schools and role models to young kids in our community, and we believe that that is something students should live up to and do with great respect because they are the future leaders of tomorrow. Uh, we want to thank you one more time for uh, allowing us to come here and present this to you tonight, and we are happy to ask any questions, and I would like to take one last second to talk about the domino effect. When dominoes are lined up one by one, first, and the first one is pushed down, they all fall onto the next, one after the other. This effect can be directly related to drug testing in a sense that when a student tests positive, we are going to be able to provide resources for them to heal physically, emotionally, and socially, which in turn will create a healthier learning environment and create better classrooms and more interactive students. Um, we've provided the dominoes for you, and all we ask is that you take that final push. Thank you. Thank you. Does uh, Dr. Rogers? Gentlemen, I just want to thank you for your research. And, and uh, I know we've had discussions about this with ADs and principals. And, uh, and it really may be time uh, to move forward. Um, 
I appreciate the fact that you looked at it globally from more of a non-punitive as opposed as opposed to you know a law enforcement kind of a look because you you hit on something as far as support and resources and aligning that with where kids are at and what the need is you can see even even pre-pandemic and then especially through pandemic a lot of times with the alcohol and the drug use that's a you know kind of a crutch uh, a, uh, a, a whether it's gateway or whatever but uh, people are self-medicating from issues like depression and anxiety and other things like that that are going on and uh, m not to mention the social pressure you know vaping and things like that so I, I appreciate that you included uh, the non punitive nature you know and these other district policies did um, did you feel when you did your research did the district did the schools athletic director administration uh, was there a student role in that or coaching role how as far as how they implemented that did you get a good idea of, uh, of how they you know um, there are some issues not only of privacy and um, but you know some HIPAA related issues anytime you're doing testing we learned that through COVID um, as far as uh, did any of the districts provide more of a practical uh, like um, procedure not the policy but the actual steps of how to implement that successfully and lessons learned did you when you when you were researching that did you find any of that so yeah so in the in like those little packets to have each school district's policy they have a little bit of how they implemented it and same with like the schools on the like the main proposal itself but all the schools that we talked to they all said that it was like it was a great thing that they got a lot of negative tests, which is a good thing because they had less every year. They're having less and less people in drug, like okay. using drugs. So, but it wasn't designed to, they didn't see a decrease in participation in activities. They were just able to get kids the help that they needed. Yeah. So that... like, like Ogden's especially they used, um, they, you had to sign the like waiver form. Like when you go to be a part of the club or the sport, uh -huh. And so in order to do that, you had to sign the drug testing, like to allow you to, to drug test. So they didn't, they didn't see any less people do it. Most people just signed it. And I'm hoping that because of COVID, when we already had to test, that people will be more willing to test because it's just kind of been a, it's just something everyone's used to at the high school. You just got to get tested for everything. So, okay. Um, I also think if it's something that the students really do enjoy that, it's something that they'll be willing to do, and um, they're not just going to give it up because they have to test once every two weeks or something. Yeah, at the most. <laughs> yeah, at the most. <laughs> so. We used to drug test in Wendover. Do we still do that? Because it was really positive there, and a lot of the parents appreciated it, and the students mm -hmm. fell right into line with it. So, so when you were talking to your the students and, and it was going through your Senate and everything, did you also bring it up with your I, – I, I know about the IOC at, at Twill High School. So did you talk about it with the clubs and the club leaders? Are um, they – how do they feel about that? Uh, we just kind of brought up that we were going to be presenting this in front of the school, and that was pretty much it. We didn't really get into, like, a discussion with the IOC okay. with all the clubs there about it. We have talked to, like – uh, individual students uh, and captains of the teams and everything and um, from what we've heard it's been something that they're they agree with and yeah um, Valerie thanks uh, other districts who've implemented this is a did they implement it in all the high schools in their district or do you know um, I think it kind of depended I know like I think Ogden it was kind of different because I also added Ben Lomond's like their, like how they implemented it. I think theirs was kind of optional for implementing. So I, it's kind of been both. Everyone just kind of has a different way of doing it around the state. So there's no really right or wrong way. They all just do it differently. Okay. Any idea on other uh, Grantsville High, Tooele High? Uh, Julie already mentioned Wendover, Dugway. Have uh, were you guys able to reach out to them and and does their student body? Do you think they? Feel the same way have you had any discussions about our other district schools yeah so i i've only talked to the sbo's from stansbury okay. and grantsville 
and they both seemed like they were on board. We have some Stansbury SBOs here to help support it. So, okay. so just from what I've talked to them, they've seemed like they'd be wanting to. So, cool. Thank you guys so much. Especially, have both of you graduated already, or just one? Yeah, we both. All graduated. right. Well, so. and I know there's. Anyways, thank you for coming yeah. after you're done. <laughs> thank yeah. you. We appreciate yeah, no. it. That's really awesome. I think our future is bright. <laughs> Will you, you both, are... if we implement this, promise to come back for another year so that you can see how it goes? <laughs> yeah. or... we'll, we'll run, be super run away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, 4.2, summary of the 2019-20 School Lands Trust uh, final reports. I think, is Sue here? Um, hmm. Okay, if you'll notice, it's the 2019-20 report. Uh, and it's just, it, it's policy or something that it has to be shown. It's Correct? A, it's a rate. Sorry. No, it's okay. I can't remember what you told me. In the past, they used to have us give you a summary of the final reports, and then they didn't require it, and now they're requiring it again. Okay. And we kind of missed that, so we hurried up and... Put it on. Put it on. Okay. But it is a summary of what they've done. Okay. And so you yeah. can see the budgets. They've been really lenient with schools with covid and those excess budget funds this year and it's like just put it in your plan why you couldn't spend it all but you just need to see those final okay reports. oh does anyone have any questions on those okay let's move on to 4.3 uh, proposed budget from lark it's interesting you were talking about trust lands just before that i'm glad uh Joanne caught that. I, I sit on the state committee that was going over this, and they, and there was a there was a feeling amongst a lot of districts. We do a good job of approving the plans early in the year, but nobody ever knows what happens, and so that's that's why they ask that these get put on a board meeting just to report back, I guess. So that's great. Um, let's see if I can share the screen here, um, and we'll jump into the PowerPoint. Uh, um, as far as our, our, our budget uh, that I emailed out to you all, um, it's posted on our website. We have a first version of it out there as we get ready for the, uh, the next school year. And uh, I just wanted to go over what's in there, kind of some highlights um, for you as we go through that. So the first thing I look at is just overall, um, it's good that we always have a balanced budget. Um, um, that's something that the state requires, and, and we do our best to, to stay within that. Um, which they define as uh, the expenses equals the revenues, you know. Um, that can include fund balance in there, but uh, in this year we happen to have it where our, our revenues equal the expenses, which is always a good thing as well. Um, you saw in there that uh, um, the general fund, uh, which I'll talk about here in just a bit, but uh, the general fund revenues increased by over $6 million, and we can thank the legislature for that. Um, general lo and local in, in our projections here, and we can thank them because of that 5.92% uh, WPU increase this year, which is um, is great, you know. Um, there was, er if you would have, a year ago now, uh, there was panic because of everything that was setting in place, so it's, it's great that we have that good news to share. Um, as far as it, um, overall, because I look at all funds, you know, the, the full um, finances for the district, um, we had a $3.5 million increase in, in our revenues for the base budget. Um, as far as expenditures go, we'll go over that. Of course, uh, we made sure we included all the negotiated agreements in there. And uh, we have, uh, pro uh, we've projected to increase our expenses by $52 million. So you'll see the $3 million up above, $52. How does that work? Because $50 million of that is considered other financing, but it's from the bonds to help build schools. So. Just wanted to point that out as you look through it to remember to look at that other financing area. Um, as far as the general fund goes, I, you've, I know you've, uh, hopefully we, get, we upload this yesterday, so hopefully um, for those of you who have already read through it, I won't read everything in here, but the, as far as local funds go, I didn't include a, a 
property tax increase in this one in the base budget because every year we, um, I interpret the law, we need to present it as if there is no tax increase. So you can see that and then make the decision about increasing taxes. Um, and, and what you could do there. As far as the state revenues go, um, so you can see I just had minimal growth in there as far as local net. Uh, every year, assessed valuations increase, so um, that's why there's uh, minimal growth there. As far as the state, uh, as you can see, most of it does um, come from, from uh, property taxes, or uh, not property, sorry, uh, income taxes throughout the state. Uh, they projected to have a good well, that's where we got our $6 million um, that we talked about uh, due to the large increase in the WPU from the legislature, so that's good. Um, as far as the reason I didn't show a lar uh, larger growth is because uh, we've had a, we wanted to be conservative on our student numbers next year. Um, as you know, it's based off this year's um, students who were attending school, the average daily membership, and then they have a growth factor in there that they take that growth factor from the October 1 count every year. I actually showed no growth this year because there's a, a question mark of that we hear about the online students going back post COVID, um, how that's all going to shake out. We won't know because we don't have our crystal ball for October one, but to, just to be conservative, we built in no projected growth in this, in this base budget. Um, and then the federal funds, even though I, I put in there that, uh, I do believe that they will be more. We just roll forward the ones that we know are ongoing. Um, we have been told the ESSER 3, as they call it, or CARES. How we, um, I guess they call it the American Recovery Plan now, the third one. It's, it's, it was larger than the previous two, and we've, we're told that's coming. So, uh, matter of fact, I believe sometime this month we'll have the numbers from the states. So um, I'll just build that in our working budget when we know what those federal funds are, but I do expect we have more federal funds coming. For, for clarification or help me understand, that's... But that is one-time money, right? True. I mean, is that 7.3 that's here? That is, I guess, in federal, everything could be one-time with federal. But the, we anticipate the 7.3 that's listed as being reoccurring. To be ongoing, yeah. Lot, I mean, the largest two being uh, special ed, IDEA, and uh, Title I okay. have traditionally been ongoing. And so those are the ones I build in. Yeah, there, not the one-time. Is there a way that we can call those out separate from each other when we get <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> when we get the one-time monies and we could maybe track those separate i feel mm -hmm. like those are okay but just because what we do with those matters i mean mm -hmm. right if we put it into a place that we're committed and it becomes ongoing for us then we have to find a new revenue source when those funds dry up but if we use those for one-time kind of expenditures then it makes sense. Yeah, anyway, that, just from my preference, I don't know if we can just keep those separate so that we just don't say federal funds and we just have this one bucket of money, but let's talk about federal ongoing and federal one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great example. So I, I consider the 7.3 the ongoing we've had for years, and you're right. Is, um, I, I shouldn't say that. I do have some CARES built in there. We know what CARES 2 is, so there is some one time, but that's a good point. We ought to break out the one time and ongoing and and I can do that at a future meeting. Yeah, yeah I, I, because exactly. the one-time stuff becomes, for us, for me, it feels like that could be, we could use that for one-time stuff too. Mm -hmm. I, and, and that yeah. feels better than built, baking it into ongoing. And whether that's a bus garage or whether that's an offer or whether that's whatever, but that's the one-time stuff is totally different. That's just from my perspective, but that would help me as we make those decisions moving forward. Good, good, yeah, that's, that's a, yes, that's a good idea. As a matter of fact, uh, Speaking of what we've done with the one time so far, as you know, we had a CARES 1 and a CARES 2. We've actually already spent the first allotment of CARES. A majority of that went to our one-to-one -one initiative um, and all the supplies that we needed to, to um, get us through COVID. And so we've, we've spent that. We're actually on the second allotment, and, and that's what's helping fund, if you're curious. Um, no, I was going to say summer school, but we're actually using gears for that. So it's kind of tied to, t to, to the first cares but yes we're we're um spending up some of those on one-time projects so far but that's good we ought to put put that in and show you for sure um, but that's our that's our revenues in a nutshell for the general fund as far as the expenditures go um we just uh the majority of it as you know goes to salaries and benefits i mean we have our contracted services have been growing and that's because of the number of contracted um service 
providers we use. Um, specifically, as our online girls, uh, we contract out a lot of that. Um, but the, the salaries and benefits, as you can see, I wanted to put that first point in there, what we negotiated. So you have the highlights um, for uh, the salaried individuals. We talked about adding 3,000 to the base. All of them received a level. Um, with support professionals, they actually asked for another level, so that they, they negotiated two levels. They were awarded, and then um, a 54 cent increase to their uh, to all the uh, levels, a flat increase for everyone. Um, that's so that's what we built into the budget. And as we started that and got looking at it, uh, um, we felt that we actually had some excess. Uh, we're going to have some excess funds this year, and that's due to because of the large growth we had last year. We had a, a large amount of growth, um, online growth. And, uh, and the value in WPU. So I felt like we could be a little more aggressive. And so what I put in there was this last minute increase that we proposed, and it's actually built in this base budget um, to add another $2,000 to all salary schedules, of salaried ones. So that would actually be a five plus five on the base instead of a $50,000 starting salary for teachers next year, it could be 52, for example. Um, I also, uh, we, we, we built in to uh, with support professionals to increase that amount, an additional 61 cent they were given, so that'd be a dollar 15 raised to every level in there, in addition to the two steps. That that happens to be in this in this base budget. And uh, the other thing I wanted to celebrate was a zero percent insurance health insurance premium increase this year. That uh, is due to the efforts of the district over the last few years. Uh, I've never seen a zero percent since we've been here. Um, that's something to celebrate. Uh, I, I remember years, a few years ago, could have been three or four years ago, we were at 110, 115% uh, uh, usage of, of the premiums. And as you know, the, the industry, stand, they expect around 90% to go in, to be paid out in claims because they have the administration of it. They, they expect a, a portion of that. So to be in a spot where we can actually have no increase, that means we've been running below that 90% uh, the last few years. And it's a combination of things. I'm not, I'm not going to say it was all our change to the share network, which is pushing some wellness and some other things, but uh, um, it's definitely a trend we want to keep going, was my bottom line there. So, I, Could I just, for clarification purposes, just for accuracy, really when, when we talk about negotiating with support professionals, it was a meet and confer and not a formal negotiation because they did not have the the majority numbers that are required by statute and district policy so just uh, gotcha. but we've done that they, they haven't had that they're getting closer but the last two years we also I mean they're employees and we want to do a good job by all of our employees so yeah. I'm really excited about the compensation focus uh, uh, that we have you as of a board have uh, have really challenged us to you know be competitive with Salt Lake and uh at fifty-two thousand for our teachers, and then our um, starting wage will be over thirteen, almost fourteen dollars an hour. When I got here, it was nine. So we've come a long way, and I know our people have been patient. But gosh, fifty-two thousand will put us in the top five uh, uh, districts as far as our starting wage. And then our schedule doesn't top out. You know, it doesn't have a top like just a lane 15. So even our lifetime earnings look pretty good. So, I mean, that's just a huge shout out to Lark and his leadership and to our association partners. So thank you. Well, thanks for that clarification. I'm sorry. I, I instantly think we negotiate for everybody because it's all employees for me. I, I view it that way. We do care about all employees. And so, but good correction there. Formal negotiations was, was with one group. I'm sorry. Um, so then, then I wanted to focus on kind of our major ones outside the general fund, which is the majority of, of our expenditures. I shouldn't say the majority of our expenditures. We spend the next place we spend a lot of money is in capital, as you know. And so our capital projects fund, um, wanted to point out in there that of course I didn't build in a tax increase. Um, we can talk about uh, changing that, but we did get an additional million. I think I talked about that in the state capital outlay at a, at a past meeting, and I. And I Consider that one-time money because it, it has fluctuated greatly in the past and is um, going back to my opinion that we can't have the continued growth that we've had. I mean, at the sustained level, and, and I'm told that as, as growth, as we 
get, growth gets back to normal, um, what we would normally expect, I should say, you, that'll that'll fluctuate every year. So, um, but that that's definitely some uh, good good news that we have that. And of course, I've I've already talked about the the selling of bonds, how it's another financing. So, um, as far as expenditures go, we just uh, as you know, we you review that plan every year, so we make sure we build that in. But uh, at the end of the day. Um, you know, when when we're building this budget, a balanced budget, we can actually, as you see, have over 57 million in construction. And I say that uh, to be, I use the word aggressive here because I've talked to Ian and Mike. I know that's going to be more than we need for the elementary, which frankly um, won't be completed maybe by the end of next fiscal year. It'll be getting close, but we'll, um, I know, I know as we build schools, there's always some lag in the billing and getting it paid that'll that'll go into fiscal years but i, I wanted to point that out because this means we could be aggressive in starting the high school and and that's something that mike and ian have talked about maybe even starting as far as uh, moving the dirt in the location uh, maybe even buying i think last time we talked about buying steel if i recall right because we're worried about it the inflationary cost so my point is we we can uh, we can definitely have some money there to build in the budget to help us out to make sure we can start some of those things if we, if it'll help save us costs in the, in the long run in building the school. So just wanted you to know about that, that good news. Our debt service fund, well, that just all goes to paying our, our, our bonds. And uh, since we just issued some, we're going to have some uh, new payments for next year. And, and basically, I want to make sure we have those covered in our, in our base budget. Um, the food service fund is... Uh, Three years ago, it was always, as you know, it had been a concern, but this is one that I've said before, the federal subsidies have really helped. And actually, I got an email from Casey yesterday saying that he, um, if I recall right, he's expecting a $2 million surplus this year. So it shows that it, it, it's running good. Okay, and I have to ask the same question. One time or ongoing? <laughs> yeah, a lot of that... Uh, it, it is, yeah. Uh, I mean, it depends know, on it, Congress does. I early get it, because there's no such yeah. thing as ongoing, but... Exactly. When I don't think it's sustainable dollars, but... for sure. So I think it's a little bit in, in one time. Um, but, but that could be, for instance, I think we can use it for services related to, right? Mm -hmm. So part of those, I know further down in the agenda, there's a conversation about, I mean, the bus garage, but also um, those ancillary service stuff, right? They're moving the warehouse and things. So we could, couldn't part of that be applied to like building of, the where or the remodel of the warehouse for instance and use those funds there because it's related to food services um well th this one is set apart for yeah has to go into the food service program per se so um i see what you're saying if, but if, if we're building if there's a some walk-in fridge some over the there funds, walk -in yes, for schools we can we can look at that yeah um, but the majority of it goes on a per meal basis, and because uh, the the subsidies are happen to be pretty high right now, and they're giving they're providing more lunches than they would typically would right. in a normal year because of these subsidies, that's what's built it up. Yeah. But I was just thinking out loud that we could use some of that excess as long as it's in the same. Mm -hmm. If I understood right, we could use that. But but Good I point. just am asking that as we're starting. I'm trying to think how we can do some of these other things without impacting our budget. And if we've got a million dollars that can go towards some of those food service offices and refrigeration and warehousing and those sort of things, potentially that could help offset some of those other costs. Maybe. But you're, you're, you're the idea. guy that we, has to tell us if we can really do that. Gotcha, so that's gotcha. why I'm well, asking. We'll, we'll look into it. I, I know Casey's already had some plans of some, spending some of the one-time money on some equipment and things he needs. Uh, I know he's talked about getting a, a, a different vehicle for them, but uh, but those are also good ideas. You know, as we start looking at that, we'll see if there's anything we can carve out in the construction process. Okay. Thank for, you. So, but good. the good news good also, point. Lark, is that we won't be looking at any kind of meal price increases for students or for adults. Okay. Is that? I actually Accurate. didn't check that. I, I believe so. But I, well, because the subsidy continues, I don't think we've looked at the price we're charging. So, but I, and I as that amount of subsidy Casey. drops, then in order to cover expenses, I mean, we have to be very careful with one time money, to Scott's point, not to rely on one time money because then what happens if that subsidy goes away? Then we have to look at increasing prices in order to break even. So, right now, we're going to be able to 
I think, keep our lunch and prices for adults and students at the same level. Um, I only hesitate because adults uh, aren't part of the subsidy, and so I can check on that one. As far as expenses go in, in this fund, we, because of the subsidies, we got a little more aggressive as I talked to um, Casey. Um, and this wasn't in the meet and confer that uh, superintendent was talking about with support professionals. This is after our, our conversation. We talked about um, those three bullet points there that you can see um, and, and uh, additional changes to that's included in, in this base budget. So, but and that's I think points out the cons that's exactly the concern I have is that we've talked about these as being one time kind of, but the things that you've outlined there mm -hmm. become expectations moving forward, and that makes me nervous. Gotcha. I, I feel like those kind of things need to be funded out of the program with ongoing, whether that's an increase in lunch costs or whatever. But if we're, when we start to add days and when we start to add hours, and that 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 is my mm -hmm. that's exactly my concern is we need to keep one-time monies on one-time projects it, it, very good concern i i just wanted to stress that i at a meeting i was at with the state they also he it kind of puts them in a pickle a little bit I, if you put your uh put yourself in casey's shoes um because the state will require that if the the fund gets too large in balance um they have to make a plan to spend it down and if you actually talk to them, the first thing they'll recommend is increase wages. Um, and so that's his fear is as it grows, it will get to the point it's too much. So you're right, we can spend it on one-time funds. Those are a quick way to, to do it. But um, one of the things, the first thing the state is gonna recommend is look at, look at the, something you have control over, which is wages. And that's why we feel like with a, knowing that the subsidy and how much it's growing, we felt like we could be a little more aggressive this year because it, it could have a $3 million surplus that we have years to um, look in, you know, to eat I, up. But, but I think that's... But it's but, a good but, point. But, but I point. also applaud what he was suggesting about maybe the equipment. I mean, that could be another example is what I'm looking... I mean, yeah. it, it, I just get nervous when we start to commit long-term commitments with one-time money. Yeah, and, and I, I am too, so I, I appreciate the caution. That's something we need to definitely look at for sure. So, Lark, I have a question. Um, on the lunch managers, if we increase their hours, does that qualify them for insurance? Um, they already have it, yeah. So, it, so in this case, it's just increasing okay. their, yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, well, I hesitate because there's all the managers, my understanding, and I'll call here in the valley, um, all the, all, I'm, the outlying areas do not, some of them do not have full-time lunch managers. Um, so it can depend, but all of them here, yeah, full-time benefited. So, um, then the other funds we deal with, I just listed them there. There was really no major changes. Um, student activities was, uh, we had a large estimate in there last year because this was new. We weren't sure how much we were going to have to pay for um, fee waivers throughout the year. And... Uh, Notice we probably over, probably overshot that, but that's nothing wrong with that. Um, so we just made small adjustments throughout those funds, as you can see those or, or read through them. Um, on the foundation, um, because uh, I did talk to superintendent, I wanted to bring up this is just more because of my conversation with him. But uh, that did include when. Uh, again, going back to we look at all employees throughout the district. Uh, when I roll, when I give people levels and advancements and everything that's built in there, that would include the uh, foundation employees. Um, but my other second point is there we still cap the uh, contribution to the foundation at two hundred thousand. So um, that moves into my next point, which I think is as I was asked to present this, I think Valerie asked if if we could talk about uh, the Ofer. Canyon Learning Lodge. Maybe I've called that wrong. If I am, uh, my friends in the back can correct me there. But uh, um, I just wanted to bring up how kind of my conversation I, that I had with Linda on this a little bit. But the history, um, some of you here could give a better history than I can. But uh, as you can see what I wrote there, the, the last time I recall us discussing this as a board, um, we decided not to make a contribution to the project. The intent was that the uh, um, foundation would look for other sources of, of revenue at that time. 
but of course, uh, the second area, which I'm not going to focus on, when you start talking about a lot of federal money and one-time money, sometimes th this comes up. And so I was specifically asked, can we use some of the CARES funds? And uh, in that one, ESSER 1 and 2 do not allow us to use them for capital projects. There may be a potential for ESSER 3, from what we're told, but uh, the first two could not. Well, you know when? When will those details of ESSER 3 come out? Um, I, I was projecting sometime this month we might know what they are. I was told that the, the legislature did not restrict this for capital projects, but uh, when I mention that, one of the things they always talk about, I, I would hesitate using it to build a building because how do we, you get my opinion here, but how do you justify using um, CARES funds to say that it was, that it was COVID related and went to help uh, the pandemic to build a building per se? Um, I, I believe when they, they said capital, they're thinking more of the lines of um, air filtration systems and things to existing buildings that cost a lot of money to upgrade to make them so that uh, uh, is, is more what along the lines I think of when it comes to capital. So that's why I steered clear of the th second section and focused on the third. Scott. Well, I just wanted to, oh, but. Valerie, is it my turn? Either one, <laughs> Valerie or Scott. I just wanted to point out um, in connecting it with COVID specifically is the outdoor, the concept of the outdoor learning and building the building and proving that the outdoor learning that they're providing there. Okay. Now we the, could, uh, if you, if you want, we can look at the, and talk about that at a future date. That's, but I, I personally would steer clear of it. It, it just uh, unless. gets nervous. It seems like a very natural use of funds to, I mean, part of that is also economic stimulus and, the, you know, the argument can be made there. But, but I think what, to your point, I think we need to follow the law and maybe we could just get more information. And I think that that's where we need to be before we make that kind of a decision because until we know, I mean, it, it makes a big deal. It's a big d decision point, right, where that, which pocket, if it's coming out of a pocket, what pocket it's coming out of, so. Exactly. Maybe we could just get more clarification and then we could make those decisions. Yeah, and I can definitely look in and, of course, we'll have to interpret it because this meet that intent of the law, but we could do that. I, I steered clear of it because my opinion was the third was easier to justify, and that third bullet point is taxpayer dollars. Um, as a matter of fact, that was my recommendation to, to uh, Mrs. Clegg is just let's, if we're going to, as a district, make a contribution, I said just ask for it, in my opinion, because... Um, this goes back to uh, this one, and the superintendent already knows where I'll come from. I always talk about what's our priorities, and, and I want to make sure we have enough funds to build what we need to build. But if there is an excess, I'm not saying it couldn't be used uh, um, as, a, as a contribution to the lodge. Uh, definitely, it's up to you as a board, what you, and that's why I put in there my quotes that you can see that I always love to share. Um, we can't do everything, but if this is a priority and we want to make it a priority, you can do it, and that's that's what I'm saying. Um, we'll we'll of course. Uh, I think that's best for the discussion amongst yourselves and how how big of a priority is it, um, Madam Chair? Oh, yes, yes, Dr. Rogers. So I wanted to weigh in just a little bit, um, and I certainly get the the concern. I, uh, I, I guess I have a different feeling. Uh, I think the foundation has done a very good job of approaching other partners like Tooele City and Tooele County who have indicated that based on their information, it would be a permitted expense on the ESSER 3. And it's real difficult when they ask, uh, what are you guys contributing? You know, if you're asking us for an additional $300,000 from Tooele City or Tooele County, and they recognize that it's really a, a challenge if we're not even matching that. You, and could you just clarify what you said? I just want to make sure I understood yeah. what you said. You said they are using S for three monies for that. The plan is to yes to do that. Okay. So, because it, 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 their understanding is that the legislature didn't limit that, so uh, to uh, not being able to fund capital. Now I get the nuances of what Lark is talking about, but I'm also back to Scott's comment: one-time money. Um, you know, we're going to have additional expenses, whether that's air purification, whatever. We have a process that outlines capital outlay. And um, uh, I just think it's time for us to commit to, to that program. I would be very much in favor of that. Obviously, you need to feel comfortable with that. But 
uh, I believe uh, that that if we're going to ask others to contribute, that we need also need to be a, a matching contributor to that program. Should we talk about OFER when it's down on the agenda further? Do that's what I was actually just going to ask. I, okay, because I know it's on the agenda later, and so I just didn't know if you wanted to talk about or it just now. finish it now or, or finish it now. <laughs> Okay. Sure. I mean, there were just lots of comments, and so I wanted to at least gotcha. make you aware of an, another uh, interpretation of that. Yeah. Okay. And I can't speak for the county and the cities. Their, their ESSER funds are different than ours. I can only speak for education and what I've been told, and I've been told that it can't be used for capital other than ESSER 3, um, potentially. And so if you want to, I mean, we can look into a legal opinion on it if you want, but I'm just doing what I'm just telling you what I've been told. Oh, so. we're not shooting the messenger. We're just asking if we could get clear. Okay. That's why I personally, as I said, steered towards the three because that's what you have most control over. Sure. But the third bucket there. And then, and then finally, um, the last thing I wanted to, to bring up is, is, is would you like to basically that I should preface this with a question I've, ex, I've interpreted, but haven't actually asked you. I'm, I've, believe given our past history that uh, I've thought it'd be best if I bring you a version two with a tax increase and let you make a decision um, in our in our future meeting so um, just some early numbers of what would that look like um, just last week I was informed by the county that the certified tax rates are out there what that means is I can not actually certify it because there's two that are missing but I do know that what they're saying is I do know the assessed valuation for the county and as you can see there it grew 11 point five percent in 2021 uh, talk about a, a huge growth it went from 4.8 billion of assessed valuation um taxable assessed valuation in the county to 5.4 so lark just since it's on that point that's only on the either the the property that's been reappraised i mean that gets the revaluation that about isn't it? it's a quarter of the county homes right each year as well as any new, and that's how the difference comes, right? The new, yeah, you know, they've actually gotten away from quarter, quarterly. I remember years ago saying that. That's what I was told is they, I'm told they're actually changing properties every year on some people's on, values. On you've probably homes. seen it. You've, your personal ones that you've been seeing in the mail um, may have been increasing every year instead of uh, I mean, that's better every four than or every five, four years like you get crushed, right? Okay, that, that so, helps me a little bit. So it, it, they've changed the way they're doing that as well. So, but yeah, it, it has grown. Um, and I probably don't need to tell you that home prices are, are definitely increasing. I have heard multiple people say that. So using that logic, just knowing what's on the, at least the taxable side that we have control over. Um, if we kept the rate flat, which we've talked about doing for years, that would, uh, and go through truth and taxation this year, that would generate an additional 5.4 million in uh, property tax revenue. And, uh, and of course, I'm not sure how to allocate that by fund yet because of those missing factors above, but hopefully we'll have that detail by the time we meet in a couple of weeks and, and we look at this with a version two. Could, I'm gonna ask for a version three too. Okay. Just because, or 2.1 or however you wanna name it. Sure. But it, there's a significant increase on prices of homes, and not just homes, but real estate businesses, you know, property value. It, it affects all of our community. And, our, our, and, and one of my big concerns is with this significant inflation of property value in our community, that the potential is there that we will see significant, and not just this year, but next, depending on when they, when they did that reappraisal, right? Because next year, it's, it, you know, if they did it in January, it's already <laughs> gone up at, you know, that much more again, right? And my concern is that we have the potential of, of really, I, I know we'd reap rewards. I mean, as the district, it's almost like we won the lottery, right? Um, or the potential is we've got all this money now, and we've got all this these funds, and I, in some ways it kind of feels like, oh, we got to spend it. But I think as a board, we have to remember whose money that really is, and that's the communities. And not only, I guess, what I'm thinking of is besides going with a certified rate, could we actually go below the certified rate and lower the taxes? And what would that look like? Because there's several things that you've proposed in here that we're spending money on. 
you know, you, you added the, that extra $2,000 on teachers above the negotiated rate, for instance. And, you know, and, and that's great, but we already had negotiated that. And it feels like maybe instead of that, maybe we could instead lower and go below certified rate and what that might look like. Because at the end of the day, it's our constituents who are paying that. And I know we have to balance between our taxpayers and our and our teachers and our schools and our students and it's kind of that balancing act and we but I just am concerned about how much property value has gone up you know it's gone up a third or more and that implies over the next you know not this year maybe but even the next round or, or next year at this time we will see that windfall multiplied and, and I'm concerned that we shouldn't necessarily spend it and you know, our constituents aren't seeing those kind of pay increases. You know, their their salaries and their take home and their retirement income and those kind of things aren't inflating that much. And as the largest tax collector in the district, yeah. in the county, right, thank you, in the county, I feel like we do have some obligation to those as well. And so that's why I guess I'm just asking if we could at least look at, you know, instead of spending and trying to find places to spend, we could just do the opposite. And we could say, what could we do to get our rate below certified and, you know, lower the tax rates? It would be my ask. We could at least have a version three so we could talk about it next time. Okay. That's my logic behind it, too. It's not just to make you do extra work, I promise. It's not the goal. <laughs> Keep That's, going. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, think, I'm just thinking about it, but do we, you know, I've never heard of, I mean, you could obviously go below the certified tax rate. I just haven't heard of, haven't done that yet, but uh, <laughs> we could look at it. Well, but, but I, I guess it just still comes back to the fact that, you know, there's a bit, there's bit, there's, there's small businesses in our community that their property value has increased. 30 or 40 percent easily and they're going to be paying 30 or 40 percent more in property tax here in the next and maybe part of it's this year and part of it's the following you know depending on when the the mm -hmm. appraisal cycle hit right but that has me yeah. concerned but then they, they how do, do we raise it back it, it becomes our certified uh, rate and, and we can have the com all I'm asking for today is not debating w no. yes or yeah. no, but I just would like Clark to look at that, and then we can see what the numbers say. We can have a conversation. That's all I'm asking, because mm -hmm. I don't know either if I would really support it, Melissa. I'm not saying <laughs> this is this is really a Scott, conversation. I'm a little about, nervous right now. <laughs> no, but it's a conversation about. I need we, to see what we, it looks like before I can make a decision. Yeah, and I I agree with you as far as being concerned about all of us. I mean all all of us know that our taxes are going up because our appraised value is, and that's a harsh reality that the secret of Tooele County is out. Yeah, and it's going to impact and, But greatly. we have to be able to support our schools. That's why. Yes, yes. We, but we have to use that with the prediction of other economic variables, which is, that's a fair conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, We're, I agree. We, we don't I just know, think we need we to. We don't know post-pandemic. The legislature won't know that number until, gosh, they don't talk about that number, Bob, until January or February when they, or December, when they, when they look at quarter one and two of the new fiscal year, yeah. um, what, what that will look like. It, so. it just, I think it's a real issue. And it's just money that, as, as I saw here, it felt like... It was nice to see a budget that was like, oh, gosh, we got so much, we got to find more places to put it, almost. I mean, that was kind of almost a feeling. And so do we really, or could we live on what we had already planned and just cut back the taxes? A skosh. I would have some real heartburn backing away. Even though we've negotiated, we've also had other discussions about wanting to keep up with Salt Lake. And 50000 is competitive but it doesn't keep us at the top and we know they're going to be lifting theirs they're already at 50 and they're going to, it's just that constant chase so we just have to look at all those variables absolutely yeah Agreed. so version one just so i'm clear uh the, the, i'll call it this base budget here um in theory is not raising taxes um, it's bringing in the same revenue as, as in prior years. It would be adopting the certified um, rate. It would be adopting the certified rate. Version two, um, 
I planned on bringing in it, showing as if we kept the rate flat, which would be 5.4 million. There's, and of course you could go anywhere in between those. Um, uh, version three, um, I'm just trying to picture, I, I get we can cut it. It's just now, is there a certain thing we can cut out as far as? I, I was just looking at keeping, keeping our rates, what we'd already negotiated for instance. Um, look at some of those other things that we had kind of put in and just, you know, just kind of clean that up a little bit. It might, might not make that much difference. I, that, okay. I don't know that, but that's what I'm asking. And, and it may not be worth it. I mean, you know, one one thousandth of the point zero 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 whatever it probably doesn't. But but what is it doing to all, all to all those fixed income, all those small businesses, all those property owners that are, are getting a tax, a significant tax increase, and we can't just say, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just adopt the certified rate, but there is potential we're getting enough in the certified rate with the other growth that we may not need at all. That's, and it's a may, Lark. I, I, that's all I'm asking. Okay. Just look. Okay. Well, there. And then, uh, actually, that was my last one was questions, but I know we've had them as we, as we walked along, so. Um. Are there any other questions? Okay, Lark, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all the discussion. Okay, new construction update. This is always exciting. <laughs> It is exciting. It's fun. Um, there's a lot going on, and uh, I'll try to just pass through, pass over things quickly. If you have questions during, um, as I go through the different projects, let me know. I've tried to just put a few pictures to each of them, and uh, kind of uh, some highlights of where we were a week ago. Um, so again, just yell if you have a question as we as we move forward. Um, where do I point it? Okay. All right, so the first one I want to just kind of give a brief update on is Ibapa Elementary. Um, you can kind of see there from, uh, that was from last memo or on Memorial Day on Monday. Um, they were actually out there working. They were working Saturday as well to get the framing up. Um, as of right now, as of yesterday, when I, I was out there, the walls are all up. They started to fly the first trusses yesterday. Um, most of the roof decking should be on by next week. Um, they're, they're doing a really good job to, to hit that, that um, completion date of early next year. Um, a couple of Saturdays ago, they poured the floor slab. It was actually pretty neat. I drove out there, um, and all of the cement came from Parsons out here in Tooele, and so all those cement trucks drove out to Ibapa, and they had several mechanics kind of staggered in the train of them to make sure nothing went wrong. It went without a hitch. It was uh, a pretty cool day. Um, if you go to the construction website on the district page, I have a video of, of them doing that. Um, but yeah, things are going great out there. Um, it is a struggle with getting out there often enough. Um, it is a long ways out there. It takes pretty much the whole day. Um, but it's, it's always a good, good trip out there. Um, we are going to be putting new playground equipment in this summer so we can try to get some of the work ahead of when we were originally planning it. So the kids, hopefully next school year, will at least be able to play on the new playground equipment as, as things go. Um, there. So those are some pictures of the, the vapor barrier underneath, which is that yellow, which um, goes underneath the floor slab, and that's them um, actually pumping the concrete in. So the next one, just a quick update on 20 wells. This was from about a week ago, and it looks, to me, it looks quite a bit different if you were up in the air. Um, they have more of the footings um, poured. They're starting to move around towards the front of the building. You're starting to see the whole outline of the building take place. Um, the classroom wings all have their footings in place. The foundation is starting to go up. They're part starting to put the insulation up on the, on the footing um, and backfilling that underground utilities. Um, Conduit, electrical, plumbing is all going in. Um, Bud Mahas is doing a great job. 
The, the note there, we've talked about it before, is the joist and deck. Um, like we've kind of hit on, um, construction materials are very volatile right now. There's a lot of unknowns and um, it was one of the first things that was ordered as soon as it was awarded to Bud Mahas, but they're still looking into January before those show up where normally we would have expected those November. Um, so it, they're not thinking it'll impact the schedule, but it will make it tight. Um, we won't be able to put the roof on so we can't start any finish work and you know sheetrock, all that stuff that could get damaged until we can get the roof on. Um, we'll keep you up to date as, as these things go, but we're trying to figure out as many ways as possible, get things ordered um, to keep on top of, of the, the changing climate. And it's changing daily. Um, all the information we're getting, it's, it's as good as we can get, but it's, nobody can really quite uh, predict what's going to happen next week. Um, yeah, there are some pictures of the footings being prepped, formed, and then um, poured. All right, so Deseret Peak High School. Um, so that one's still in the kind of preliminary design phases. Um, we're meeting every week uh, and then some. We've discussed the HVAC system to try to find the most efficient um, way to heat and cool the building. We're trying some different things that we haven't really done before with condensing boilers and some other things that are a little more efficient to operate. It'll require us to learn a few things, but we feel it's the, the best direction to go moving forward. Um, it'll help us have a good, comfortable, and efficient building. Um, we have been doing a little bit of work on site. We've been having the geotech study done. Um, so you may have seen a few trucks out there digging some holes, seeing what the soils look like. We don't have that report back yet, but the preliminary look when I was out there, things are looking favorable. There's no um, large areas of collapsible soils that could cause a lot of expense. Um, the drainage looks like it'll be good. So um, that was a, a good good thing, which is what we were kind of expecting. Um, so we bought a better site than the prison, so we don't have to drive all those much better structural beams into the... No, it's, it's a great site. Um, like we've talked about before, there are some different things we're working on, uh, you know, taking advantage of the topography. Um, have they evaluated, uh, Mike, uh, ground source heat? I know we have that at Dugway, just the size. Have, are, is that when you talk about HVAC and we've, discussing? We've looked at it a little bit. Um, the problem so far we're seeing is there's not a great spot to put the well filled okay. for all of those. Um, some of the playing fields are pretty far away from okay. the building, um, but the condensing boiler and some of those other things that we're doing will still give us an efficient building. Um, it's not out of the picture yet. We haven't done, it does cost some to, we have to test the conductivity of the soil to see if it would even be viable. And we haven't done that yet just because we're not sure if that's, if it comes up that it might be an option, we're definitely gonna look at it and see. And uh, with VCBO and the mechanical engineer, they go a little bit different than Dugway. If they do a geothermal, they still kind of have one main unit. So we don't have all of those individual heat pumps. So it wouldn't change things drastically. It would just be another source of where that could come from. Um, we do have a meeting set with Tooele City tomorrow to go over this with them to get their input. We met with them a couple of years ago before the first bond um, didn't pass. And so we're getting it back with, you know, things have changed with you know, how much growth is happening in the area. We did a traffic study. Um, I believe it's been updated. So we're gonna go back with the city and see um, you know, there are a few things we need to do. There's a sewer easement that runs right through the building that we will have to adjust and, and move, which shouldn't be a big problem. Um, is the, the layout of the campus, is this more current? I, I think I remember, it looks like the soccer fields now to the east. And is that, is this, yeah. re this is reflective of kind of where you're going It's today? a lot closer to, yeah, we just met again today and a few things have shifted and changed. Um, what they're trying to do is, as we get the survey done, we know the heights and the elevation, so we're trying to reduce Moving the dirt, amount right. of dirt we have to move and the amount of retaining walls that we have to place. So things are shifting a little bit to try to make I, everything a little more... I, I like this for one other reason, and it's not, but just I, before there was a parking lot cleared out on right. the north end, and it seemed like it wouldn't ever really get used except for maybe when somebody's playing tennis or something, but I like the fact that you brought those 
more to campus. Right. It feels like that would be better use, but that's just no. yeah, and that that's was, minor, but I like this better. Yeah, and, and part of that was there's a detention pond that needs to go in, and you can kind of see it highlighted in that circle up in the top corner. Um, it makes it wanted to be in that corner. That's the lowest spot is that uh, upper um, west corner, so it made sense to move things out of that so we can use that to store any um, excess water, which hopefully one day we'll have. But um, so yeah, there have been, uh, and even just looking at it today, there has been a few adjust, adjustments and tweaks as information has, has gotten better. Um, and so that is one of the things that we are doing is looking to, to cut costs. Um, and it's by those relatively simple things, removing walls, um, creating more berms where um, you know, grass or um, rock or some sort of landscape you can take up the grade change rather than put a wall in. Um, we've reworked parking lots a little bit. We've um, shrunk the, the footprint of the building a little bit, um, reduced some square footage. We've originally we were hoping to put mechanical in the building, but we've had to put it on the roof like the rest of our other buildings just to, to save us some square footage. Because um, kind of like we were talking about, the, the construction costs are just getting insane, <laughs> to put it frankly. Um, I've talked to two different construction managers, and the last three to six months, they've seen about a six to seven percent uh, cost increase. And the last several years, it's been a five to six percent for the full year. So you're looking at a potential, you know, seven, you know, fifteen percent mm -hmm. increase just in one year. Um, the bids that have been coming back in across the state have been coming in fairly high. Um, a lot of it is there's a lot of unknown. So a subcontractor over a three-year period, how do they bid a project and know that, you know, if they bid it today in three years when we need their product, how do they bid that price? So right. we're looking at options. Um, you know, it may be some sort of contingency fund that we as a district hold, and as they have cost escalation, cost increases, they you know, provide evidence of that, and then we could release that rather than them, you know, just hope and you know, guess that how much it'll go up. Right. Um, it'll be the actual dollar amount it goes up. Mike, um, are the horses off of that? I'm not sure right now. We did have them moved off um, while we were doing the geotechnical reports and studies. Because um, there's fencing, or mm -hmm. there was, but I imagine with easements, et cetera, and access to the property, that's going to have to... I know, I've talked a little bit with Kevin England. He's been kind of that contact. Um, okay. We've liked them there because they help keep the weeds down. And so as long as we can keep them there, as long as it's safe for them and it works for us. But um, kind of to the point that Lark was talking about a little bit, one of the things we're looking at doing to save a little bit of time and money is possibly and probably doing an early earthwork package. So we'll get the building will still be in design a little bit, but we will have the, the site designed. So this fall we could be moving dirt. Um, and part of that would be a structural package that we could we're trying to standardize on the sizes of the of the steel, and there's some maybe some areas where it's a little bit oversized because we're unknown. But if we can get it out early, that 10 to 12 month lead time will save us a little bit of overage by beefing up in a few areas. Um, it's been really good to have a construction manager on board who is working on multiple projects, who has great contacts with a bunch of different subs and suppliers to to try to talk and figure out what's going on. Um, so Hughes has been really helpful with, with trying to figure out where this is going to land because it's, I don't think it's going to be really hard to, to hit that original estimated budget of the 84 million, just with how much things have gone up. Um, there's also the roads that, like I said, we have the meeting with Tooele City tomorrow, but 2400 North and Barra Boulevard, um, you know, that could be on us to, to install those. Um, we're going to, right now we're budgeting we're, we're that way and we'll see what happens with that. Um, but that's just another expense. It's not part of the building, but we've got to get it there. We've got to get students We're hopeful that with the development coming in that we'll be able to piggyback and partner on some of that so that the roads aren't totally, in my mind, there's some development responsibility on the part of developers that are developing other areas there on 2400s. But. For sure, we're hopeful. Will, will that come up at your Tooele City yeah, meeting? Yeah, we're going to bring that up with Tooele City. Um, like I said, there was it's a traffic study done last year, and I've met, I think there were some updates done. Um, there are some you know, long-term plans that would require improvements of some of those roads and intersections, but they were fairly long-term, so we're hopeful that we don't have to 
lump those in as part of this project. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of lot of unknowns still off-site that we're trying to. And so we'll we'll work on that and we'll do as best we can. Um, we have had a good working relationship with Tooele City the last several years, um, so we'll, we're hopeful that the meeting tomorrow will go well. Can I ask you a question? Sorry, mm -hmm. I, it's um, is this is ignorance. I just don't know. That's normal that we have to put in city roads. It is. It, in like the... like. So in Salt Lake District or Granite District, if they're building a school, they have to put the road in? Potentially. Um, it is in state code that they can't force us to put roads in unless it's contiguous to our site or required for access to the site. But it's listed that under those two circumstances, they can, we can be required to, to pay or help pay for the road. You remind the city that we'll remember them when the next RDA comes along. <laughs> we'll, have a, we'll have a good discussion tomorrow. <laughs> And we're hopeful we can work something out between the, all the different landowners. Um, it's going to be a huge benefit to that whole area of town, getting another intersection off of Highway 36. Um, I'm just hoping we can really negotiate and work as a team. I think I'm like, we're all in this growth issue together. And to say... There's good precedence. And that's why I'm wondering good just the, already with that. Okay, I mean, good. Mm -hmm. I, anyways. I, no, I'm hopeful it won't be confrontational tomorrow and um, like this will be their first look at it since we've met a couple of years ago so there'll be more meetings with the city um, so we'll we'll keep you apprised to, to what happens but no it, it's getting exciting we've looked at uh, so we've been meeting a lot we're starting to meet with the engineers on it to get things refined um, um, we've worked to integrate the offices as directed uh, a couple weeks ago and that's we're close to that um, we're working the numbers with district administration on figuring out how many offices there needs to be. That's the, 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 the hard part is these flexible classrooms with, you know, now a rigid number of offices to make sure that we, we hit it right. Because if we build too many, then we're not using the money properly. But if we miss it by two, then we're two teachers that are homeless. And um, so we're working on that. And we've had a lot of help with, um, with district administration to, to get that number right. And it's... Uh, I don't have a picture of that. I should have included it, but it was kind of in flux when I did it. But basically the area where it was the, as it was called, the bullpen, we've kind of lined that with offices and it has a kind of a conference room out in the middle that's enclosed that could be used by staff, students, however it's designed. But um, yeah, again, we're trying to find spots for, for all of those, but they're, we're getting close to pinning that down. Any other questions on the high school? And that's kind of a, a big topic right now and um, a lot of unknowns on that one. So I think I'm just about done. The, just a quick update on softball fields. Those have been completed. We did the last uh, final punch list items the last over the last month. Um, still a few things to finish up there, a few bugs like always uh, to get things worked out. But from what I hear, the, the girls you know, love it, the softball team. Um, and uh, it was a great project to work with Bud Mahas on. It was our first one with them, and you know, they did a great job for us. And then we are again using them with, at 20 wells. But there are a few pictures of, of the softball fields as well. But OK, so that was, was all I had. Like I said, I do have uh, the district website. I'm, doing, I'm trying to do better at keeping those updated every you know, couple times a month. Similar to what I'm doing here, just kind of a general you know, highlights of what's been going on, some pictures to keep people up to date. Um, but yeah, are there any other questions on the current projects? Thank you so much. I um, am so grateful for all you guys have done. I know the whole board is, and I um, just know that as bumps in the road take place, I, I hope our public will remember and understand the the questions and the thought and the hard work that has gone into building these schools for our kids and it's not just throwing up a building it's really thinking through things and trying to so anyways we appreciate your expertise you. and what you guys do for us thank you okay director of human resources report She told me it was like a 35 minute presentation, you guys, and it's really exciting. So she's well, got, she's take ready. As much time as possible. She's ready. 35 <laughs> so, minutes. Go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to just get into the, 
there we go. Okay, so our statistics at a glance. So last year, um, our personnel leaving was 103. And this year, two year to date, as of last Thursday when you received the packet, we are at 57. So that's almost half. Um, that number will, will go up a little as the summer goes on and there's, you know, people that are moving or husbands got transferred and people wanting to stay home with kids. So that'll, that'll raise a little, but we won't hit 103 for sure. Um, our administrative certified employees are 52. Our administrative classified are 16 and our, th that are leaving, sorry. And then our classified total is 1,199 and our certified total is 808 which gives us a total of 2,075 employees right now. And then our retirees to date of certified are 11, and then our classified are 14 this year. Do you guys have any questions about that? No? Okay, so the next one is um, our volunteer management and um, working with BCI. So we're gonna continue to use App Garden. Um, we have updated our fingerprinting machines. They're a lot quicker, a lot nicer, easier to use. <laughs> it's it's going to be good. Um, we are um, staying in state compliance with BCI and uh, initiating the five-day drop for a wrap back. The wrap back is just um, the new system we're using with BCI where educators don't have to come in every time they need to renew their license to get their fingerprints done. So if they're in the wrap back system, it's just automatically going to run it for them at that time and will renew their fingerprints. And is that the same thing with parent volunteers too? They just have to come in the once and then we have to renew it. The one I, time with, with the volunteers that come in for, are they on the same level, the volunteers? Are they wrapped sorry, back as well? Maybe no, that's, that's not, a great question. I didn't I, think about that. I think this last time I updated it without having to get the fingerprints, but may, then so I had some people ask do, on are that. Are they wrapped back or is it just our certified? They, they will be on wrap back unless they leave. So the point is, is when you have a volunteer that comes on, we hope that they stay on for a number of years because that's uh, that was what we went through with an audit with BCI or Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Yeah. Is that if we if they leave either volunteering or working with us, then they have to we have to drop them within five days. So so yes, as long as they stay with us as a volunteer or employee, then it stays. Okay, so that's why I had to hurry and renew in a certain number of yes. times. Yeah. Okay, we've got to okay. Yeah. And then once and then once you're dropped, you would have to then come in, redo them, and pay the fee again. Yeah, that that's something sense. PTA so we need to probably yeah, push. Probably be so that how are you dropped? How do you so leave? So a five day drop, like if you leave the district or you're done volunteering, right? You could, but, you're, you you get out of App Garden. So if you're, uh, you're dropped from the App Garden, and why would you be days. dropped at, like as a volunteer from the if app? You just didn't. I well, because you have to renew that App Garden every. Yeah, every so often yeah, every okay year, yeah so, so if, you're not if you're not if you don't renew don't, it then it drops you it drops you I and see. so that's where we have to get the word out with yeah. PTA to better sure to make sure yeah check that well, email and am I understanding that right yeah oh. because with the way that we had the volunteers is that everyone that came on for years and years they would be on the list and the schools had the list but we never knew when they had moved out of the area or their mm -hmm. kids had graduated out. So we had to have something that we could maintain on an annual basis. So that's why if they do leave, if they're not gonna come back every year, they have they get the email to say, are, are you planning on coming back to volunteer next year? Or if you change schools, moved, whatever, then we need that update in order to keep the wrap back going. And what the wrap back is, basically if there's a hit on their record, then we get that hit on their record, mm -hmm. like an arrest or something like that, then we get that so we can ask questions about those uh, particular incidents. So anyway. It's a lot better. It's a lot better. Yes. So, um, so there's going to be, there will be an increase this year with volunteers being allowed back into schools, which is good. We didn't, I mean, there wasn't much cost incurred this year because we couldn't have volunteers, but next year we anticipate that to, to go back up. Um, and then currently our volunteers are not charged for their background checks. So, um, any questions, any more questions with that? No? Okay, next slide. So um, ESS, um, this last year was tough. Um, 
because when with COVID, first of all, but then when we went to the online day Friday, we had a lot of substitutes that needed that fifth day of income. And so we had a lot leave to go find permanent work where we, they could work all five days. And so that was kind of tough at first um, to fill subs. But with the challenges, aside from that, Twila and the Utah team in general was feeling higher than the national average for sub absences. So even though it seemed like we were always short on subs, we were actually filling higher than everyone else nationally for the subs. So um, during Christmas, we partnered with businesses around the community and we got donations and stuff. Um, and they were able to have like a daily drawing for subs that were willing to work still. Um, and through this, we also reached 27,000 individuals within the community. Um, we added three building-based subs to Tula Junior High School. Um, which means they were just there as permanent subs and that helped a lot with some of our sub issues and just taking care of unfilled absences there. That was, it helped a lot. So um, I think we were gonna talk with Amy about seeing if that might be kind of a permanent thing for that school in particular, just having those set subs there, it worked well. So that's a, that's a conversation we're gonna have with Amy. Um, I attended an event yesterday, June 7th. It was an appreciation event for our subs and they were able to, um, be entered into a drawing and get prizes and stuff and it turned it was nice the subs appreciated it um it was all good feedback they loved working for us and so it it turned out really well um training and recruiting and hiring will continue throughout the summer and uh ess was able to adjust pay and incorporate uh, longevity pay so if a sub worked 20 days then they would get a higher higher teacher pay so Kind of an incentive to kind of keep them in the rotation so it was helpful that helped okay um we have licensing maybe or no was this recruitment oh recruiting so our recruiting efforts they were impacted this year due to the pandemic again so all fairs were held virtually which is hard um there were no shows or no signups on all of our virtual schedules that were open. We didn't have a ton. Um, we only saw two to five, five being generous, potential hires in state um, at, those, at those job fairs. And then out of state virtual fairs were zero to one candidates maybe that would sign up. So it was, it was tough. Um, In-person recruiting is always best. It helps us build relationships and kind of sell our district and stuff. And um, there, it's, there's more traffic when it's when it's an in-person recruiting fair um we see more licensed students too and are able to kind of build that rapport and you guys are always welcome to come on those with us when we go see what we do lots of fun huh terry <laughs> okay our road to licensing i think is the next one sorry there we go so we are doing the apple program our district apple program and it's a licensing program approved through usbe so we do that all in-house now um, it's kind. It's made it easier. It's been a learning curve because we've had to kind of build the program, but it's worked well. Um, we work with candidates holding a bachelor's degree or higher that are interested in becoming a teacher with us is what the Apple program's for. Um, we've partnered with Salt Lake Community College. They have a transition to teaching program which provides those specific pedagogy courses to these candidates at a much lower price. So it's helpful. Um, to get them licensed <clears throat> we also have a grow your own grant um, that we turned in at the end of may and it helps with paras um, that are working and going to school to become teachers and it helps kind of fund them for that so that's been awesome we had a lot of interest in that and we've we should be hearing back on that funding soon so and that's also a continued par partnership with slcc to kind of jump the the, pro the process there so um the LEA, sorry, not working. There we go. To professionals. So there's three licenses we have now. It used to be an LEA or level one, level two, um, and so on. And they've switched it now to where it's just three licenses an LEA, an AEL, and a professional. So the LEA licenses are the ones that um, we have for educators that are working to get their teaching credentials and that those are the ones that you guys sign and approve at the beginning of the year for us to be able to license them within district while they're finishing that process 
once they get an LEA, they're working towards their associate educator's license. A lot of them will get that quickly because you just have to have your bachelor's degree to be able to get your AEL through the state, and that's an associate license. Um, they, the AEL is good for three years while they're finishing the program as well, and then they, um, we recommend them for a professional once they've finished all the requirements through the state. Um, this is just a look at the professional licen licensing plan that we have for all of them. These are kind of all of the um, competencies and um, coursework that they have to take for each and every one. So it's kind of a, it's a process, but quick glance. If you guys want to know more about that, I'm happy to talk with you guys about that individually. It's kind of a, <laughs> it's a mouthful, this one, but I'm happy to sit down with you. Okay, um, and so our licensing stats for this year, currently we're working with 110 candidates. Um, 52 are on LEA specific licenses. Uh, 32 are LEA endorsements, which means they're secondary educators that have their license, but they just need the LEA for the endorsement so that they're qualified to teach in their content area, if that makes sense. And then the AEL licenses are at 26, and these will all change over the summer as people go from LEA to AEL. These numbers are gonna switch up, so if you're interested in what those are at the beginning of the year, I can give those to you too. Um, the total recommended that have received professional from us so far are nine, and that number will go up as well. We have a couple people finishing their coursework this summer, so we'll get them recommended and they'll be licensed up. Okay, our exit surveys. So you guys have that packet as a separate document, the Qualtrics survey, it's big, lengthy. Um, efforts are underway to kind of clean up the offboarding process with our exit survey. So right now we have one that we use from the state, but we're kind of working on coming up with something that's a little more conducive to Tula County School District and the experiences here in particular. So we're hoping to get that cleaned up for this next year. Um, there are a few slides that I just kind of thought were interesting to share. Um, so some of these, like how, how was, good was your supervisor at providing positive recognition and feedback? How would you rate the adequacy of Tooele County School District's training opportunities, which is one that was interestingly rated to average and we'd like to be able to offer more of those when and if we can and how we can help, um, help them. And there's just a, a couple others about communicating and positive recognition and feedback and handling complaints and suggestions. And so that's kind of it, just a couple. And again, you guys have all of that, that information, that data from Qualtrics, so we can talk about that at any time if you guys want more information on that. Do you guys have any questions or notes on any of this or want to know more? Or? The only thing I just wanted to say is yeah. a shout out to our principals, like yeah. the exciting, like how great it was to see the supervisors rank so high on so many of those yeah. questions. So it was great. It was yeah. neat to kind of see that. Yeah. I'm, I mean, one of the things that I thought was interesting is they said, you know, um, salary or cost of how much they're being paid. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, we're like the top five in the state. We're working on it. But mm -hmm. it was still neat to see that recognition for our principals yeah, and how great of a job the year we've doing. had. Yeah. yeah. So it's been... Yeah. It, I, I thought for the for overall, I thought it was great. I did great too. feedback. So, yeah. All right. Hey. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. You did it in under thirty-five minutes. <laughs> nice okay. job. Nice job, Tony. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have any Board of Education committee reports? I do. I just want to talk about Twila Tech really quick and JLC, I guess. So I had Twila Tech board meeting. Oh, crap. Last week? Yes. Um, and I would just ask that everybody kind of keep them in mind. They, um, as a school, have lost three um, staff members, kind of staff members. So for those of you who don't know, Scott Snelson, who used to be their um, president, passed away about a month ago. Um, and then they also lost their industrial maintenance teacher and their program manager, Mark Walker. So um, just kind of keep them in mind. Um, and then they've also had some kind of exciting changes to their board. Joyce Hogan retired and T Tom Bingham retired as well. And Aaron Peterson is their new board president. So some exciting things. I don't anticipate many changes. I don't think you'll see anything drastic. 
Um, but I think it will be exciting to see what Aaron brings to that board and kind of the excitement that there is up there. So, um, oh, and one other thing, this is really exciting, I thought. Um, Kim Herrera is going to be working at Twila Tech. So for those of you who don't know, she was a counselor out at Stansbury for years, and this is an awesome thing to have her back in our county again. So. Okay, let's uh, move on to our action items. Request for proposal student information system. Lark. I'm really bad at hitting that button. Um, yeah, the student information system, you can see the write-up on that. Uh, it's, uh, when you talk about uh, systems in the school district, it might, it's the largest system, I'll just put it that way. Uh, teachers use it, students use it, parents use it. It's, it's a big, big system. Um, for years, as you know, we've been using the uh, state system that is free. It's Aspire. Um, it has come up in the past. We want to look at other solutions out there. Um, some of the, I'm not going to say every, we happen to be arguably the largest district on Aspire, as I understand, the old state system. Um, so sometimes it comes up, when do we grow out of it? Is there time to get something that, uh, that may have some more features? Or I shouldn't say it's not all about features. Some of it's about updates. We've and so it, it came up, do we want to RFP this and look at alternatives out there, which uh, you saw all my write-up on it. I'll just, you saw we had six replies. Um, I think I reported on this a, a month ago that we had, uh, um, we felt like we had narrowed it down and then we had some questions and decided to ask a best and final offer to make sure we were doing it correctly. And, and it kind of changed up a few things. And so, uh, but uh, what you have in, in front of you is the recommendation from the um, committee who looked at it. They do feel like, you know, part of the weighing in this is, is looking at that state system and, and do we want to switch? And it was the recommendation of the committee to um, award the RFP to uh, Skyward. And so I think uh, we had some public information in there. I, I also had some things just for you as a board executive. I want to make sure you had those documents so you could see all our, all our details on it. So. Just um, curious if you had any questions about the process or or anything. Figures I would, but but I'm just repeating that. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but the first question I have is, what what prompted the? I mean, you said it. I mean, we were the largest without. But what prompt was there? You know, <laughs> you, you were sitting around bored and you thought, gosh, I don't have anything to do. I what, Lark? I suspect that wasn't <laughs> it. But what? Why? No, um, the big area concerns in Tamara would be the best to address it. So I, I hope if she happens to be listening in, she'll correct me tomorrow. But uh, um, there has been some concerns in the past amount of time that employees spend on it. And one area that I have, con uh, I know was addressed in here, we, we targeted certain areas that were specific. And one of them was counseling. Seems like there was a lot of, there's been a lot of issues um, as far as scheduling and counseling and uh, and, but that's not all of them. I, I want to bring up that they've had some issues with updates and things breaking, and uh, the, uh, those are the things also, that come back to me. I would also add uh, we had duplicate entry, a lot of time. Uh, you know, it, it, this Aspire system is kind of a garage-based uh, lack of a lot of support and uh, features that count not only counselors but teachers are using. They had to dual entry their grading book because it doesn't talk. Aspire doesn't talk with Canvas and or Google Classroom, that kind of a thing. There were some compatibility and and just you know real strong feature issues. Good. Thank you for bringing that up. I yeah, my my wife uses it much more than I do so. <laughs> <laughs> in the family, but uh, like I said, a lot of people use it. The last district to uh, Skyward is used by um, Alpine and. I think Jordan. Canyons and Jordan. And Canyons. Just, yeah, Canyons. Yeah, Canyons uh, Jordan. Uh, Nebo's the last one to leave the actual, which made us the largest one on the Aspire. If you'll remember several years ago, there was a threat to not fund it from the state office anymore, and there's very limited support. So um, most of the larger districts have already moved. 
the charter schools and some of those LEAs that are, you know, have very small districts still like the Aspire, but it just wasn't working real well for all of us. Anyway, it's a good question. It, and the, I was trying to get pricing. It's about six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars. It's not cheap for the one-time setup fees. Yeah, and I think a hundred and I I remember focusing on the ongoing. So I know uh, that's because that's what I going back to the ongoing versus one-time costs. Um, I know we would need to budget uh, hundred and fifty. That's what I recall off the top, but I can pull that up. Which which one was being 000. recommended by the committee? Just it was Skyward. Skyward. If you see the one with the names in it. That yeah, I, I pulled that spreadsheet up under the executive content. Thank you. So it's one fifty six ongoing, okay. or yearly. Exactly. Yeah, and of course uh, something that large, it's not just going to be set up overnight. Um, it probably will be realistic to have a year of. Uh, set up and running this and getting things online before you actually go live um, i've heard everybody say you need upwards of a year because it's it's that large and so many people are involved and so it's it's definitely a process and that's why they have one-time setup fees they got to migrate everything over use our data um and get all our student ids in there and everything so big project right, secretaries and principals and teachers to use it i i, I did speak with rick uh from um, Nebo, the, the superintendent, Rick Nelson, and he goes, there were a few bumps cutting over. Now they cut over to Infinite Campus, but he said now that we're two years in, it, it's been very good, and our parents are very pleased. But make no mistake, anytime you change your SIS, you're going to have a few bumps. Yeah, that's my that's my concern. <laughs> I'm worried about uh, what that patron said earlier, you know, making changes, especially after the year that we've come out of. I haven't heard the best things about Skyward, so I am a little bit concerned. Um, I don't Is that know. because of changeovers and they haven't really implemented it for long enough? No, just... Um, my niece, the school she goes to, uses Skyward, and my... Um, brother and sister-in-law are not fans of it at all so that's just personal that's probably personal because they've never preference. used aspire they think right. theirs is bad <laughs> this may be true <laughs> it's relative i guess my and i just want to make sure that it, it's a huge purchase and it's a lot to change and is now the time to be making this change or is this something that we could do another year and then look at making this kind of a change. We're not looking at changing between now and this next year. Well, I it takes a year to implement. Year. We, we've got a, a year to run it parallel with a lot of time. So we've got over a year before we would cut over. See, I guess what I was, if we waited a little bit longer and then we could implement it with the new high school. You might have a price increase. Yeah. But and it's all the district. It's not just it's one school. It's all the district. It's all but because it would take a year to get in place and then with the new high school open it up. The, the other thing, and of course it's been a couple of years since I used Aspire, but the Aspire was getting to the point that it doesn't interface with a lot of the things that we're asking our teachers and everybody else to yeah. do. And so I think we I think we have to be progressive. I, I've heard I've heard it's hard to get to, you know, over the transfer and things like that, but I think any of these things would be it doesn't matter what one you're going to. Uh, I've talked to the Alpine School District, and their teachers seem to like it once they once they've got to use it. You know, it takes it takes it. It's got that learning curve. But, but your state of the art and one to one devices and technology. Yeah. And you're running an archaic. You're running Windows 1.0 on your student information system. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Well. I'll give you a motion that we uh, accept the recommendation of the committee and move forward with a contract with Skyward for the, what is this for? Student information. SIS. SIS system. Is that? Second. It's been moved by Scott, seconded by Bob to uh, move forward with the RFP for, with Skyward for the SIS system. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mo motion passes. Um, new policy, family and education privacy, second read. Um, 
Matt, did you have anything else to say on this? Okay, it's the second read. I'm just looking for emotion. Let's do emotion. I don't want to be the emotion. Uh, whatever. Uh, emotion that we accept the new pol uh, we adopt new policy education family privacy. Moved by Scott, seconded by Julia to approve a new policy, education and family privacy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Revised policy 3016. It's the first read. They are, I think, oh, moving forward to a second read. Sorry, Lark. Yeah. Um, this, I'm smiling because you just saw this last month. We just adopted this model policy, and I was sitting in a meeting and was told that um, in January of this year, the state actually changed Rule R33-5, um, as you can see in there, that I attached, and changed their definitions of uh, small um, purchases and upped the limits. And so... Given that it changed, I thought this could be a good opportunity for us at looking at increasing our limits that where we that of course require bidding, and so I took the R um, thirty three five uh, suggestions and and made those tweaks in there. Now there is a um, as I pointed out to to Jackie, there is one area where even though they have a hundred thousand dollars on some professional services and some construction. There's a construction code that overrides that and says 80, so I left those at 80 because the code would, of course, overrule the rule. Um, but the professional services that I didn't think were related to construction, um, so they have a design area that I left also at 80, but the uh, um, professional, the other professional services, I up to $100,000 in the recommendation. And of course, just an item changed from 1000 to five. Um, so I, I thought that'd be a good tweak. I will say that the state, I was surprised about this, so I got looking up what the state is doing. The state of Utah, if you're curious, um, even though they changed this rule and allow it, still have the $1,000 threshold. So and a state employee wants to buy something for $1,200, they have to go get another bid. Even though the rule says that, they internally have 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 uh, said we're setting it at a lower rate. We can always do that, but I like personally like the five and would recommend we move to the five. Um, now, with that said, I, I'm sure unless you have any questions, I was going to point out that when I first wrote this to and Jackie came in and I appreciate her help. She asked, "Do you really want to come back for a second read?" And my thought was, we've just traditionally done that to receive public comment if there's any concerns about this. But she uh, reminded me that if you feel like adopting it, we can. It'll still out there, and they can still p comment on it at any time if you. So I'll leave that option up to you guys. Well, I'll motion that we adopt uh, the revised policy three zero one six for implementation. I'll second. Moved by Scott, seconded by Camille, to adopt, or to adopt the revised policy three zero one six small purchases. Is there any discussion to that motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Donation to the Twila Education Foundation. Dr. Rogers. We actually talked about this a little bit in the budget presentation, and uh, my recommendation at this point in time to move that project forward would be to um, award that request to the foundation with one-time funding, whether that one-time funding be allowable under you know, S or three, or whether that one-time funding comes from capital um, uh, reserves. And um, I would also like to recommend that we suspend the policy on naming facilities and consider uh, naming that facility the Dalton um, Learning Lodge at Ofer Education Canyon or Ofer Canyon Education Center, uh, and that's a shout out. I, I, I know that we 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 allowed uh, Dugway High School with George Bruce, who was significant in 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 you know and is still alive, and we're very glad that Ed is still alive, <laughs> Ed. But uh, you know he's looking at retiring, and it's really his baby. He is the 
uh, the uh, um, founding director of the foundation and really has been so key and instrumental. I just think that would be very uh, an appropriate designation as the Dalton Learning Lodge at the Ophir Canyon Education Center. That would be my recommendation. Um, if it's okay, I will make a motion that we donate, I don't even remember the amount. <laughs> Was there an amount? <laughs> it's not on the thing. 300,000 was requested. Okay, thanks. Um, that we donate 300,000 to the Twilla Education Foundation. And can I, in the same motion, can I? Could we, could we talk about them separate? Okay, you could. then that's my motion. <laughs> Second. Okay, it's been moved by Valerie, seconded by Bob to approve uh, the donation of $300,000 to the Twilla Education Foundation for the building discussion to that motion. I, I'm, I have a lot of heartburn about that until we understand where those funds are coming from. I, I just, the, the conversation we just had earlier about, you know, I don't remember my acronyms, the, the federal cares <laughs> number three, S or three or whatever. I, I, I just, I, I you know, just like a home, you got to know what the, where the budget comes from, and and until we know what pocket that's coming out of, I, I you know, it, it feels really wrong to me. If if we have the conversation a, a month from now or whenever Lark gets that information, then I think it starts to become a. But right now, it, it just seems very broad to just say, well, we'll give you three hundred thousand dollars, but we don't know where it's coming from. It makes me a little nervous. Not Ma a lot, Madam nervous. Chair. I, I understand what Scott's saying, but I'm also not saying that it, it comes from those one-time funds uh, it, or that Lark's, you know, what Lark, I'm going more with that third bullet that Lark said is it's, this is a priority. I think this OFER project has been a, has been a priority. Uh, I've taken the opportunity to ride up there and, and seen marvelous things that have been accomplished. And I, I think, you know, I have to agree with the superintendent. I think that if we're asking other entities to help help with this then then I think we need to and and so I I understand your concern about the cares money or whatever that acronym is I don't care but uh, <laughs> I I really think that what I'm more concerned about is we're just saying this is our priority and that and that we want to, to see this project through and so that's why I'm voting in favor of it the other consideration is is that as a board previously and in recognizing it's not the same board i mean there's the changes but we've in the past given you know initially it was a the, the foundation was a single part-time employee and and when we add that up now you know in this budget that we were presented today it, it's you know two hundred thousand we are giving the the education foundation two hundred thousand dollars a year it's not as if we're not helping with the foundation and so I, I guess, and I realize it's not specific to this, um, but the point of the foundation was to go out and get those community donations, uh, coordinate that. It, we, we can save $200,000 a year if we don't fund the foundation, if we're just going to fund things ourselves anyway. And, and, whoops, I'm dead. And, and I understand what you're saying, Scott, but I also, I also think that if we really took and and itemized or looked at the things that the foundation has brought in and the contributions that they've brought in, they're doing their job. Absolutely. They're doing their job. They need, you know, I think this is a project that is worthwhile and it needs the help in order to be completed. And so I'm, I'm, I, under, I understand entirely what you're, what you're saying, but I also, I think, you know, I think their record speaks for themselves. I know just with scholarships and the things that are, that are transpiring because of the foundation, we've really, pushed a lot of things towards the students and I think this is just another emphasis towards students this is why it's a, I think this is why it would become a priority so Camille I actually I just wanted to piggyback off what Bob said I agree with um, what Bob is saying they have gone out and asked for those donations and have taken it I feel like almost you know to that maximum level and now our other organizations out there saying, and they know, you know, we have the 200,000 for salaries and administration costs, but it, this is also something that's going to benefit our students across the entire County. And I don't know that it's something that we can put on the back burner anymore. I think this is something that's important for 
not only our students, but our teachers and our community. And I think that it needs to become one of our priorities. Okay. Um, let's vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes. 5.5 toilet education. Madam Chair. Hold on. I'd, al I'd also like to make oh, a, I'd yes. like to make a motion that we uh, approve the superintendent's request to name to be able to suspend the rule and name the Learning Lodge at Ofer Education Center the Dalton Learning Lodge. I'll second. Been moved by Bob, seconded by Camille to um, suspend the policy and be able to name the lodge the Dalton Learning Lodge. Am I saying this correct? That motion correctly? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry, I I wasn't saying because I don't want you to. I just it's sometimes these. Robert's rules, rules, I... Right. No, Am I okay, Bob? Okay. Thank you for permission to do that. And uh, thank you also, though, for the generous support, again, to the Ofer Canyon Education Center. I just wanted you to know in that regard, right now we have over $350,000 in our little treasure chest account that we have been getting from the private sector and many others. We were informed that the county commission had approved a $224,000 pass-through grant from their CARES funds to go with that. We've also got our, some other commitments that are in line and hope that by the end of the year, we'll have at least $600,000 or $650,000 to uh, go towards the construction. We're hoping to accelerate the, the construction a tiny bit because of uh, increased building costs, the need for uh, more space and COVID and the outdoor learning things, plus the success of the educational work out there. So we're, we're in it all the time and see the, the smile on children's face, faces, how they learn and the good that it's doing. So thank you very much. We've always felt your support for the facilities and also for us as a foundation. Now, regarding this matter of naming, <laughs> no, let me just say. Um, Am I going to have to not let you talk? <laughs> I'll, I'll Madam Chair, do you have a gavel? <laughs> hey, no, but just, just understand, uh, this is a real surprise. It's breaking a pattern. Uh, it is such a kind, thoughtful thing that you're doing, but I really think you might want to just consider the real... Hmm, consequences and all of it before you finally decide. Uh, that's, this is something that, uh, uh, I don't know, it just got me off guard, but so thank you for at least the courtesy to let me share that with you. And thank you again for the wonderful support that you've always given our foundation. Okay. Can I just point out that in the past, I. In the past, there was a reason why we adopted the policy on naming. And, and it was to avoid almost this, <laughs> a, a little bit of an awkward situation. I love Ed Dalton, and he knows that. And, and for, I've known Ed since I was, what, four years old, I think. So I, I, I've known Ed for a very long time. So I, this is not in any way personal. But I'm uncomfortable with the concept and varying from that established policy that we've established for exactly those kind of reasons because it, it starts to, you know, then when does it stop? And what we had said in the past was we would name as part of that policy, as I recall, and it's been a lot of years because we adopted it, and, but we adopted it at a time when we didn't have anything on the table so that it wasn't those awkward conversations about an individual, right? We adopted it so that it's not anybody in particular and I, this is not I just you know it was set out then and and then we said we could also sell those naming rights and that was part of it you know for for donations and for you know for their and there's very clear guidelines on donate this name this we'll give you this for this and and I guess it makes me a little bit uncomfortable that we set those 
for exactly that so that we don't feel any undue pressure and it's not a re reflection of not a being appreciative but it, it does put us in an awkward situations and you know even to the future you know when, when we have to name a field or a gym or a, you know we that's why we set that up and it, it makes me really uncomfortable with that into the future and it's not in any way reflective <laughs> And I, I, I hope you understand that. I just go sell that name to somebody, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I, certainly what the intent wasn't to make anybody feel uncomfortable or awkward. Um, I'm just having a, a struggle uh, comparing that with what was recently done at Dugway High School with the George Bruce Gymnasium. Well, I think that's what Scott's saying. I don't remember that. I mean, if I, yeah. I, yeah, it might have been snuck in, <laughs> but that wasn't, because this was believed back in Terry I, I wasn't day. aware That's, of that. I just believe that um, you celebrate people who really step forward. And Well, and does it maybe feel like this is a little bit different where it's not, you know, a high school or I don't know. Part of the foundation, Clint. Something do you want to? Clint wanted to. Okay. Maybe even just one easy solution to that, as you consider the motion, is to uh, you know permit the foundation to name it, and then it's not the school board doing it, and um, yeah, it takes takes it right out of there. Make the donation the way it's set up, and and leave that in our hands as your foundation. So, just thought. Just really quick with that, just so that you guys know, I pulled up the policy, and it does say um, with the policy we can name a facility um, who's made a significant contribution to the educational system, which I definitely think Ed Dalton has done. So, But I'm okay with that idea as well, of allowing the foundation. So I think it's Bob's motion. Bob, do you want to you. change your motion? I'm, or? I'm, I'm fine with the foundation naming it. I'll second that motion since that was a formal motion. <laughs> I'm fine with uh, the found, just kidding, just kidding. We let the foundation name it, and I will draw my prior motion. It's been moved by Bob and seconded by Camille that the foundation will name the building the Ed Dalton building. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I'll keep it. <laughs> oh, right, right. <laughs> I know the doll. I know, I know. I was. Um, anyways, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Five five. Jen's T E A. Uh, Doctor Rogers, I believe. I'd really like to, as we've discussed the negotiated agreement, I'd actually like to yield my time to TEA President Rick Harrison, uh, just with a vote of thanks and gratitude for um, uh, being very um, professional, representing our teachers very well. I know we've had a little bit of uh, comment that we don't survey every single person, which is just not practicable but they do a very good job of uh, representing the voice of our teachers. There's many ways to engage with the board, and one of those is, is a negotiated agreement. So we had uh, a team of five that met with uh, a team of five from TEA that were all teachers. We used IBB, which is interest-based bargaining, and I think we came up with some great solutions. Um, I will tell you that we didn't decide that Fridays would be non-instructional, and we also didn't decide we'll never do another parent-teacher conference. We asked the question, could parent-teacher conference be more beneficial, and could Fridays work better for our students? And so we do appreciate the partnership and asking hard questions because that's the only way we're gonna improve. So Rick, would you speak to the ratification? And of course, we're asking you to ratify from the board side. Uh, and I would echo what the superintendent said. Um, uh, I've been, I think, negotiating with the district for, I don't know, 10, 12 years now. It's been quite a while. 
And um, I think the progress that we've made in the way that we do things in the last three or four years has really been, you know, uh, really unbelievable, quite honestly. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity that we have to sit down with the district and uh, uh, President Rich was in the negotiating team this year. And I think the thing that I appreciate most about it is that the district team of five, our team of five, we come together and we don't, you know, throw punches across the table or threaten or do any of those kinds of things. We sit down together and try to work out solutions that are in the best interest of our employees, the best interest of our students, the best interest of our patrons of this district. So uh, on behalf of our teachers, on behalf of Tool Education Association, uh, I want to express my appreciation to President Rich and all of the board um, and to Superintendent Rogers and the district team uh, for the efforts that they have and for the constant dialogue that we have because I think superintendents mentioned this before um, negotiations for us don't just occur on a day once a year uh, we're working all year long at problem solving and setting up uh, and making things uh, better for everybody and again uh, I express my appreciation to the Board of Education uh, as I told our teachers um, where we've come with uh, salary for our teachers in this district in the last few years has really been phenomenal and uh, you know we appreciate that we appreciate the constant effort to to try to take care of those kinds of needs with our teachers and you know I think as we look uh, the presentation from HR um, I can remember it seems like we have a hundred hundred plus teachers every single year leaving the district uh, that's been that number for about as long as I can remember and I noticed this year it's 57 so I think that speaks to the kinds of things that we're able to do in a cooperative, interest-based way. So uh, thank you, and uh, TEA has accepted uh, this negotiated agreement. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 5.6 Warehouse Transportation Building. Hold on. Oh, oh we <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. OK. We need a motion. <laughs> I'll make a motion to accept the TE negotiated agreement for 21-22. I'll second. It's been moved by Julia, seconded by uh, Valerie to accept the TEA associated, TE, I'm sorry, Twill Education Association negotiated agreement. Um, any discussion? I have a question. Okay. Just to clarify. What we're ratifying is the agreement that's, and, and it's just really two points. Well, mm -hmm. three, I guess three point, four points, the non-monetary things. I, I was just looking at some of the executive content. There's some other things here that will indicate approval that aren't there, but, and recognizing that the executive's part of that, but that they didn't make their way to the actual agreement. So we're just approving what's, here, not necessarily what that was says. just stuff discussed the minutes that yeah, was in yeah. there yeah so this is what was negotiated this is okay this is the final document okay thank you for clarifying um all in favor aye, aye. 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 any opposed motion passes okay 5.6 warehouse transportation building All right, back again. Um, <clears throat> so just for a, a little backstory, we've been working on this project on and off probably for about a year. Um, we have an architect on board, which is VCBO. We have a construction manager on board, um, which is Westland Construction. Um, as we started looking at um, what it would take to you know, retrofit the existing um, buildings on the depot, we started to have a lot of issues that came up that we felt that that probably wasn't the best long-term solution for the district. So he could do that. There were some issues with um, having room to grow, putting everything up in that one location. Um, so after we brought that back to um, some members of the district administration, they tasked us to find out what 
options are out there. So we, we looked at a few things. We looked at, you know, the, the bulk of that was looking at the warehouses, um, 647 and 649 to the east of us here. Um, we also looked at what buildings are out there to buy, you know, as is, and if they would work for us. Um, there were a few in town that we did look at. Um, and then also we, we looked at um, just building something brand new, um, designing it for what we need uh, and you know, start with a fresh piece of ground. So as we looked at it, um, and we'll go into some of the details a little bit in some of the other pages, but as we looked at it, um, the team felt that it would be best to use one of the buildings that we do have at 649 um, and use that as our main district warehouse for receiving um, district-wide. Um, that would give us, a, like it says there, nearly 10 times the storage capacity of what we have now. We have about 12,000 square feet at our warehouse number two. Um, those are 90,000 square feet. So it gives us tons of room to, to expand and grow. Um, and then we felt after looking at it that um, constructing a new transportation facility would be um, the best. It, that's a facility that's very kind of unique to work on buses. There's not a lot of buildings out there that are set up and designed to, to function that way. Um, so just jumping ahead on what we've looked at, um, working with VCBO about, I think it was five or six years ago, they did a building for Box Elder School District. Um, there's a picture of it there. And this was their second transportation facility. So it didn't have a lot of the main office things, but it, it had four bus bays, a wash bay, some offices, some mechanic spaces. And they also had some IT storage, some imaging labs. It was kind of a, you know, some of their support, a second support building. Um, we did go tour that facility and we we think that this is a good starting point. Um, you know, square footage wise, we're looking at it's roughly 15,000 square feet. Our current transportation is around 7,000 square feet if you add um, the couple of portables that are up there and uh, the couple of bus bays that are the bus bays that we do have. So it does give us some more room. Um, we're planning on designing it in a way that both ends or at least one end could expand out, um, you know, easy to add on to as whether it's transportation grows or another department needs to go there. Um, if we have the opportunity to put this on a fresh site, we could position it in a location that is conducive to adding another building or adding buses. Um, you know, one note, we looked at the site at Box Elder and it was a really long narrow site. So we actually have this building kind of rotated. So it, there's no parking. There's a lot of weird things that just where they were landlocked on a real long narrow site. Um, so that's kind of the, it's hard to see there a little bit, kind of a rough floor plan. A lot of the offices would change, but the, the overall mass of the building um, wouldn't change. And one of the things we're looking at to save money is getting a, a, a metal building we, we believe is the most economical. The biggest issue there is the time frame. But if we can get them on early and get that building and lock our square footage you know, soon, then we can, we know our square footage, then we design to that. Uh, we won't be able to expand much or any um, but I think we can we can get a good idea now and and get that building coming because um, uh, our current facility there is a, a time frame that we need to vacate that both the warehouse and the, the transportation so getting these done um, is a fairly high priority and then just looking at the uh, the warehouse that's uh, building 649 um, and you can see in there, there's not a, a whole lot going on. Um, we have a, a cordoned off area for more secure district storage that could be fenced off and, and limited access. Um, there's just, there's tons of, of potential. We haven't done a whole lot with this one yet. Um, this still needs a lot of development, but there's not a whole lot that's gonna go, go into it. Um, we feel that adding a couple of docks would be very beneficial to, to actually have as a main receiving area. So looking at kind of the scope of the, of the overall projects, um, you know, the new transportation facility would have two, or excuse me, four double um, length bays. So when one bus, they're waiting for parts or something, they can push that forward. It gives them a lot of opportunity to, to keep the buses, keep working on them while they're waiting for parts. That happens quite a bit where things aren't available right away, but another bus needs something done. And that way they don't have to 
leave it outside or, or leave a bay um, that's not usable. Um, it would cover all the offices for the current staff. We looked at adding a bus wash bay of some sort. Um, I get parking for our current fleet with room to grow. Like I mentioned, um, looking at 647, the other building, we were pretty landlocked. We couldn't fit even our current fleet. We were out of room to do that there, plus fitting 100 plus vehicles on that site, interacting with buses and power lines and, and all the development that's going on over there. The, you know, the Peterson Depot's getting busy. There's a lot of good stuff happening over there, but it does make it you know, busy for us to, to be in and out of. Um, it does have a training room designed so that they can have their in-service and um, those things that they need there. And like I mentioned, it has some room for expansion. Um, with 649, the sprinkler systems on there are non-operational. They've been red tagged by um, fire engineering. So they do need to be updated. Um, right now, there's no heater insulation. We are planning on adding both of those. Um, so we can keep them up to a minimum. Well, it'll be, our goal is 55-ish degrees, keep the sprinklers from freezing, um, keep it tempered, but not uh, not spend a lot of money on, on heating 90,000 square feet, because those are large buildings. Um, it would have the two in-ground docks, so we'd have room to receive and uh, move things in and out easily. Uh, would be new power upgrade, lighting, security, fire alarm systems, all the things that, that would need to be there for to occupy the building. And then we would get rid of the, the siding that's currently there and, and make it match with what's going on on the depot already. Um, you know, just for one example, we did look at the, the tank building, they call it, the one that uh, just by the, the train tracks over there. Um, you know, that building was about $3 million. It would still need wouldn't didn't have docks it would need a sprinkler system upgrade if we wanted to use it as a warehouse and and that was in that you know three million dollar price range for less than a third of the space um, usable space at the end so you can see this is the estimate that we got from westland construction again they're they're doing their best guess um, i feel the new transportation facility is pretty close to uh, an accurate number. Um, looking at other projects that have bid recently, um, the one that I'm not sh super, I think we can get it down a little bit, but I asked two different estimators and they both felt that that was probably a, a not knowing the scope right now, that's a fair or safe number to bet on. Um, a lot of that was on, in electrical upgrades that could pare down as we as we dig into that a little bit more. It, they're just very large buildings to, to put a lot of lights and, and security and, and cameras and fire alarm systems and like I said, the, the sprinklers that need updated. So like I said, there is kind of a, a timeline or a, a need to get, some, get this project moving quickly. We feel the warehouse could go very quickly because it's very minimal design. That one could get out to bid um, you know, fairly soon. The, the, transportation facility might take a little bit longer because we still have to design offices work with transportation to make sure that that meets their needs so our recommendation and we'll stand for questions but our recommendation would be to that this is the right direction to go that the board approves that we move this direction of building a new transportation facility on land that we you know don't know what it is yet we've looked at a few pieces um, and then taking building 649 and repurposing that as the main warehouse for the district Mike, did you include in this another slide on the the sell of 647 and that money that would offset or we would recoup? I didn't. Uh, I hadn't. Uh, I'd heard talks of that, but I hadn't heard anything um, specific. I'd heard that that was an option. That selling, you're talking selling 640, the other warehouse. They were each at 1.6 when we bought them. And of course, the error was made in how and estimating how much it would cost, but. One is at least worth, if not more, 1.6, because we paid 3.2 for both of them. I just, I didn't know if you had considered that. And we had thought about that. We knew that we have two warehouses. We're only talking about using one. Logically, it makes sense to, to recoup some of that money by selling that one. Um, but that, that wasn't taken into consideration with this. That actually was one of the questions I had. It felt like with this plan, mm -hmm. 
it, it makes more sense for the bus garage. It gives you room to grow in the future, right? So that was the first question. It seemed like we could pair off, you know, get back a million six or maybe as we just talked about how stuff's inflated. It might, you know, it's worth two million today, right? So that would really help and we get one sure. good and kind of get rid of the other. But my other, so the other question was location and you said you haven't really nailed that down on the bus garages or the transportation facility. I know we've looked at about four different sites. Locally here kind of generally is that? Yeah, there's a couple here on the, in the area of the depot. There's a few others in, in different areas of um, Tooele for the most part. We looked all throughout the county, but we kind of settled on about four, you know, three or four that were probably viable. Because proximity really matters, right? right. For this. So David Gamusio, our realtor, has identified four. The one that we really like is adjacent right across from Cabela's on the Enron or Incon, Incon. property. So and so we have those options. I was going to give you guys an update in the in, in the property executive. Yeah, sure. But yeah, we very much wanted uh, easy access, good soils, and um, enough for growth. So we were looking at 20 acres. Okay. So, uh, about, so, oh, so I guess that's my, my, just my last question. Is, are you looking for approval to kind of proceed generally? Or is, I, I guess that's what was my other question. What, you're coming today. I mean, it feels good and stuff, but is this, uh, is it in the action items? So are you, approve it's hard the to approve approach. something to, without those details of like to buy this piece of property, right? So that's why I guess that's what I'm asking. It's more just a conceptually we're in agreement. That's what you're looking for today from the board? More or less. I mean, and to proceed, like I said, there are, we need to vacate our current properties. And a lot of these there are some long lead items and it's not designed. So yeah, it would be to, this is the right approach to give us that approval. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what, I mean, you see the, the dollar amount there, and that's where we'd have to we're come back to you the, with a real estate purchase agreement to look at. We'd have to come back with you with the bidding processes uh, for the, you know, the different elements. Uh, Bob, I move that we uh, recommend that they continue with this approach of a new transportation building and also the remodeling of Building 649, and that they bring back that information as you receive it to us, so that we can keep, mm -hmm. you know, keep up on it. I'll second. Been moved by uh, Bob, seconded by Valerie to approve the approach of the new transportation building on a new site and remodeling builds building 649 as the main warehouse and get information back as it comes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I forgot to excuse Alan at the beginning. I apologize. He had a family commitment. And looking for a motion. No. Um, oh, sorry. Before we do that, I actually, can we go back to 5.5, the negotiated agreement, the TEA negotiated agreement? I was just looking at it and thinking about Lark's presentation with the budget. Um, and Lark mentioned that it would be a total of $5,000 to all current employees that are certified salary, but on the agreement, it's only showing four. So I'm just wondering a clarification on that. Back to what Mr. Um, um, Ryan. We did agree to the amount that's on the agreement. After uh, going through the process of relooking at the budget, we felt like we could do more. So that's why on Lark's slide it says we think we can do five and not four. But uh, after, uh, you know, uh, Board Member Brian discussed, you know, what would it look like if we, um, if we didn't go to the certified rate you would have to approve it that way because you're not approving that additional um does that make sense because we haven't approved the budget right but it was just an information but, but as we go into the budget then i have a question as we go into the budget we can go back and approve just the justify the, the extra money as we go well you you, necess you don't necessarily have to because we're planning on that from administration uh, where, where you would have to actually take a action is if you, if you directed us not to do that, because that was the recommendation okay. from our BA. Martin. So I, I don't know that we need that approval, but certainly with the discussion of lowering the tax rate, it would, it would play into it. I think we just needed the clarification of how that would occur. So. Right. I agree. 
There would be a lot of egg on face, mine particular and Lark's. <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to make sure we need a motion to end our public meeting and enter executive session to be held in the boardroom at the district office to discuss character and professional competence or physical or mental